good morning. Um, well, morning for me, anyhow. Hi, my name is Mark Sabatella. This is the MuseScore Cafe um, for today, September 11th. I should know the date. Um, a date of some, some note here in America, as uh, those of you watching worldwide probably are aware. Um, and um, this is my weekly series of these informal chats that I do, talking about various aspects of MuseScore and making music. And um, today, uh, I know I keep saying I'm going to talk about MuseScore 3.3, and I will. Um, but you know, we're still taking our times about uh, getting getting a, a, a good beta version ready. I'm sorry, I'm making sure it looks like I'm having some sort of technical glitch here. Um, I am trying to broadcast from school where we still have, you know, some sort of internet issues. But okay, looks like I'm broadcasting. Okay, good. Um, and I hear my sound. Okay, good. So, um, so anyhow, the, that's still the case that I'm going to talk about the MuseScore 3.3 beta once a few more things get settled. Um, so instead, <clears throat> there's a number of things that have come together to make me want to talk about rhythm today. Um, one is that this is the subject of what, well not rhythm exactly necessarily, but percussion in particular. Um, one is that rhythm has been the topic of the music theory course that I've been teaching uh, here at Regis University for the, um, so we've been talking about rhythm for the last week or so. And, um, and then also a um, really good friend of mine who was the drummer on um, all of my CDs really, uh, Tom, Tom Van Skoik, uh, I just found out a couple days ago, died um, last week. It was uh, very, very sad to hear that. Um, so kind of in his honor I, and also thinking about that rhythm's been on my mind, um, I would talk about percussion and rhythm things in MuseScore. I've talked about some aspects of rhythm before. Um, uh, by the way, this uh, handout that I'm, I'm showing you right now is one that I put together for the online course that I'm making. And this uh, is a topic that I talked about in one of my previous cafes, but it's a really nice um, uh, handout uh, that encapsulate some of the stuff about it. So let me just go ahead and give you the link to where that is. Uh, looks like this will be just the score. Okay, so if I go here, and paste it, there we go. Um, so anyhow, there's some, some things about the notation of rhythm. Now, thanks, Colleen. Um, uh, yeah, Tom was a really, really interesting drummer and really uh, just a nice person. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, sad to have lost him. He was only my age, which is, you know, mid-50s. Um, so, um, yeah, so I want to talk about drums and percussion. Tom uh, actually played in the Greeley Philharmonic. He was a you know classically trained percussionist, but also was a great jazz drummer. And uh, so most of my uh, uh, um, interactions with him had to do with jazz. Um, I know he also played in rock bands, and and, and one of his other passions was Afro-Cuban drumming, and not even like Americanized jazz Afro-Cuban, but really traditional uh, bata. Um, uh, traditional folkloric uh, drumming. So um, he was a multifaceted guy and there's a lot to talk about as far as how percussion and drums function in music and what you know what we can talk about with him with MuseScore. So anyhow this handout here um, is one that talks about this thing that I talked about in a cafe a while ago having to do with these rhythmic patterns. The fact that there's really only eight ways to fill a measure <clears throat> with combinations of whole beats, like whole notes, half notes, and quarter notes. Um, and then if you divide that in half, those same, same eight rhythms become the ways to fill half a measure uh, with half notes, quarter notes, and eighth notes. And divide it in half again, and now those same eight rhythms are the ways of um, dividing up uh, one beat uh, in terms of quarter notes, eighth notes, and sixteenths. Um, so in my handout, I also then go into the complexities that are, get involved when you start talking about three, four, or six, eight, and all. But there's a lot, uh, a lot of meat just in looking at how this works. So anyhow, that that handout is um, something that uh, I think some people might find useful, um, and it has some relevance to talking about percussion. Um, 
Uh, and so one of the things that comes up when I talk about rhythm is I, I, <coughs> I often point out that really the way that rhythm is notated in music is a little bit unfortunate. You know, when they invented, uh, developed over the course of many years, decades, centuries, when they kind of settled on the, the way that we notate rhythm, it, it's based on the duration of each note, which works in a world in which you mostly have slow-moving music. You know, in the Renaissance where you have brands that last, you know, eight beats worth of, or eight quarter notes worth of time, and you have a lot of these long notes, and quarter notes were seen as fast notes. Um, it, the notation system works fine for that type of setting, or a setting like chant, where there's not even necessarily a steady beat necessarily about it. Um, but when you start dealing with complex rhythms and, and uh, things involving subdivisions and triplets and sixteenth notes, um, then uh, it's, it's harder to really grasp what rhythm is about when only dealing with notating of duration. Really what we care about is when a note happens, not how long it happens. And in particular, if you think about percussion instruments, most of them do not have a sense of duration at all. I mean, when you hit a snare drum, it do, I don't care if you call it a sixteenth note, an eighth note, a quarter note, a half note, or a whole note. You hit a snare drum, pop, that's all you get is that length. So the, the, the rhythms as we perceive them, or if you clap out a rhythm, is really more about when a note happens than how long it happens. Um, so it's a little bit unfortunate that everything about how we notate rhythm has to do with durations, and you sort of have to work backwards from there to figure out when it happens. And in percussion music, we take advantage of the fact that really duration isn't important. When I say we take advantage of it, I mean we write whatever duration is convenient to write to allow us to write potentially many different drums doing different things all at once on the same staff with, uh, you know, you have four limbs, you could potentially be playing four totally independent rhythms if you're uh, coordinated enough. I'm not. Um, but I can do two, and I can kind of do a third one if it's simple. Um, so um, uh, I can usually do one foot, one hand, and with a lot of thinking, I can maybe work either another hand or another foot into it. Um, but uh, it's possible to write up to four independent rhythms in Muse score with four voices, but then you have all this, like, it's really complicated to read that. Uh, luckily, because in percussion music durations don't really matter, we can actually rewrite rhythms in such a way that um, you can actually notate percussion music with only two voices, or really only one, if you want. Most people still use two voices so we can put hands in one voice and feet in the other. I, I say most of us do that. In the United States, that's the, the, the uh, common thing to do. So let me flip over to Muse Score here. And I'm going to start a new score for drum set. Oh, and I'm talking about drum set here. But as I mentioned, you know, Tom plays a lot of uh, orchestral music. And in orchestral music, it would be sometimes you would put two drums on the same staff like you might notate the say the snare drum and a, and a cymbal on one staff but often you would use a separate staff for each drum or each smaller set of drums because it's a different player you might have four percussionists in an orchestra well a timpanist and three percussionists the timpanists don't like to be referred to as percussionists i understand so um anyhow what i'm talking about the complexities that come about here really are mostly about drum set, but let me go ahead and add uh, just a simple snare drum also. So let me add a snare drum, and I'm going to add a drum set to my score. And here we go. So uh, I'll add in some line breaks. Oh, let me show you if you haven't already used this before. Format, add, remove, system breaks every four bars. Boom. Oops. I must have, uh, because it already had one, I don't know what happened. Add break systems every four measures. Oh, I don't have anything selected. Oh, I had one measure selected. Try one more time. If nothing was selected, it would have done the whole score, I swear. But I had one measure selected. All right, now I have four measures per line, so I can work with things a little easier. Um, I'm going to close the uh, palette on the side here because I don't need it. Um, and 
So now I have this music here, and so what am I talking about when I mention uh, half notes and quarter notes and all this and durations? Well, for instance, in notating for drums, if I want to notate bum, 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 so one, two, three, four, bum, bum, bum. If I was writing that for piano, I would have to ask myself, was that bum, bum, bum? Is that a half note and two quarters, or is it quarter, rest, quarter, quarter? On drums, that doesn't even come up as an issue. You write it whichever way you want. And it's, I think, more typical not to pretend that half notes are a thing. And we know it's not going to be longer than a quarter note anyhow. So the most common thing is to really write it just as a quarter note. So I'm going to use the, uh, um, when I go into drum, when I go into note input mode on a, on a drum staff, um, you'll see the drum the, the uh, drum palette show up here. And there's a number of ways of using it. I like to use the shortcuts because I'm a shortcut kind of person, and I can just type uh, 5 for quarter note, and then A, and then 0 for a rest, A, A. Now I certainly could write 6, A, and then 5, A, A. I mean, I can certainly write that. It's just a, look, a little bit unnatural to write that for drums. Uh, just because a half note really doesn't exist on drums. It's not going to be any longer than a quarter note. It's not wrong. It's just in some worlds that you just don't do that. Um, but you might say, well, it's simpler, and why, so why not write this? I didn't need that rest. Well, one reason is because then this allows me to then put other things here. Like, what if I wanted, think about I'm doing that with a snare. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not exactly ambidextrous, but I, I do some things left-handed, other things right-handed, and I don't even know how I play drums, because I don't play drums. I play drums however the set is set up. But uh, if I were to hit a drum, a snare drum, with my um, left hand, and then I wanted to do something else, like ding, ding, da ding, ding, da ding, 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 you know, play eighth notes, or just ding, 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 so it's say straight eighth notes. If I want to make straight eighth notes happen, Normally, you would need two voices to do that, to have one rhythm and another rhythm at the same time. But on drums, I don't need that. I can actually write this all in one voice. So I can use, I think, G is my ride. No, D is my ride. I can just add um, a D to this chord here. And so I can, I can do it by clicking. I believe if I just click... Uh, so you see how often I use the uh, the palette way of doing things. Yeah, I just click on there and it adds it to the same chord. Um, I, you can also um, uh, double click the icon here and that adds that note. So double clicking a D will add another D. So, but I said I wanted eighth notes, right? Not quarter notes. Well, that's okay. I can make this be an eighth note. I'll just click this and then change it to an eighth note. Notice it changed the snare to an eighth note also, because this is all in the same voice. But that's okay. It doesn't matter if I call that snare drum an eighth note or a quarter note or a half note. It's going to sound the same no matter what. So this is what I mean about taking advantage of the unique qualities of percussion to allow me to write something. So now I can just put another D here, and I can write Ds there. And now if I type a D here, I believe it's going to replace that. It did. But if I type Shift D, nope. Oh, I go here, shifty, it'll add it, shift, oh, and then here, shifty. And then, again, I can change these both to eighth notes. So normally, you do this the other way around. I entered the slow rhythm first, right, and then uh, I'm using Q and W to half and double the length of an existing note, which is a way to change durations while you're in note input mode. Um, normally I would enter the faster moving rhythm first and then you can just add the slower moving one as you know as part of the chord like if I wanted a quarter note here also or a note on two again I don't want to call it a quarter note I want to call it a note on two I can click it and shift D um, oh not shift D sorry shift A except I have to actually be in drum input mode to do that sorry and shift A there we go and now I've got my, my um, snare drum there. So if I play this now, I'm going to hear the same uh, thing that I had here, uh, but I'm going to hear it now with the ride. Right? It's the same bump, 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 
as I have here, but now I have it with a ride. So this idea that we can be creative about how we spell our rhythms when writing percussion, that we can actually change durations of the notes in a way that allows us to put two independent rhythms on the, in the same voice is really useful. Because now I've got all of that stuff going on in voice one, and voice two is now free for what I'm going to do with my feet, namely working the hi-hat and working the bass drum. So if I go back to note input mode here, go back to the beginning of the measure, you see I've got B, which is the bass drum, and F is the hi-hat. So maybe I'm going to put a bass drum on one and a hi-hat on two and four, say. <clears throat> so I can type B. Uh, I'll make it be a quarter note, because why not? Quarter note B, and then a rest. Oh no, I'm sorry, uh, I want a, uh, a hi-hat, right? So I'm going to type uh, F for the quarter for the uh, hi hat, and then a rest, and then boom. So now I have that. Um, yeah, that's the the closed the pedal closed hi hat. So um, I now have a drum beat that has really four independent things happening. I've got my ride happening here. <clears throat> I have my snare happening here two different hands, and then two different feet. I've got a drum, a bass drum that's just on one, and uh, a, uh, um, a, a hi-hat on two and four. And let me just repeat that measure. I'm going to press R to repeat the measure, which is a very useful technique when using writing drum parts. So um, that's uh, something that you want to be able to do in writing drum parts is really think through these rhythms so that you can combine multiple voices onto one staff. Now if you're writing an orchestral thing you really don't have all those considerations. It's really just um, whether you write a side stick or a uh, just a plain hit. So you know the snare is not going to be doing as much and then you can write whatever crazy rhythms you want. Um, uh, Three. So um, I use the A to write that side stick and B to write the, the regular snare hit. If you're writing orchestral percussion, it's, it's usually not as complicated because um, you're, you're just writing, you're not, you're not dealing with this whole drum set thing of multiple things happening all at once. Um, but there are other things you might want to know about writing orchestral uh, drum parts. Actually, let me take this out of here. Um, and just put it in a blank spot of the score over here. Um, by default, the only hits it knows about is that and then the side stick here. But a snare drum is capable of making other sounds, and maybe um, you're, 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 when you're writing your orchestral uh, part, you know, maybe you want the person playing the snare drum to also be able to play a cowbell. Because that's pretty typical in an orchestra setting. You don't just have someone just play the snare and nothing else. You don't necessarily need one drummer for each drum. Even though you're not building a drum set, you might say, okay, you take snare drum and, and triangle, and you take suspended cymbal and, uh, you know, whatever, some other um, uh, floor, floor drum of some kind, a bass drum maybe. Um, so it's common to want to combine a couple of drums onto one staff. So certainly one thing you can do is you can go back to under percussion unpitched and add the instrument that just says percussion. Now notice I don't see it here, um, but if I switch to the orchestra um, set, then I think I will see percussion listed as an option. And now what this will do is it will give me basically a five line staff in which um, there's now icons and shortcuts for all these different things. A snare drum, a bass drum, but also, the, oh, it has a hi-hat on there. I wouldn't have added that to the percussion one myself, so I'm not sure. Uh, concert symbol, okay, fine. Congas, open triangle, yeah, open triangle for sure. So in any case, I, I look at that, I'm like, well, that's not my, my particular orchestra piece. Maybe it doesn't use those things. So I'd want to customize what's what, like maybe the pedal hi-hat isn't something I use a lot, but you know, uh, maybe there's an open triangle, there's a concert cymbal. What is that sound? Is that a crash? Yeah, that's a crash. Um, you know, that thing. 
Um, but maybe it's some other, like this concert snare is snares on. Well, what if I want the sound of the snare snares off? That's, a, that's maybe in here, maybe not. I'm, I'm thinking it's probably not in here. So maybe I need to add that to my, my thing. So I'm going to use this edit drum set here. And um, there's all these different sounds available. And open snare is apparently not one of my choices. So I would need to know. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit unfortunate that these aren't predefined. But what I can do is tell you how to find this out. I'm going to go, um, actually let me go to a different page here. I'm just going to Google for uh, open snare general MIDI. Because um, the deal is that every sound has a, um, a particular pitch that goes with it that's defined by the MIDI standard. And I'm thinking now that maybe that sound, open snare, isn't actually one of them. What do you know? So um, what I'll have to do is use one of the tom tom. Um, sound. So maybe this uh, high tom, uh, high, I know I saw high mid tom. Is that all the best I can do? Okay, I'm going to use that one. Oh, high tom, there it is spelled H I. This one's spelled H I, that one's spelled correctly. So MIDI pitch 50 is a high tom. And uh, high mid tom, in case I decide I like that better, is 48. So if I come back to my um, mu score thing, I can now uh, sort my list by number, find MIDI pitch 50, select it, and um, give it a name and call it Hi Tom. Hi Tom. That's uh, nice that I'm using that one, right? Hi. I feel like I didn't spell hi right, but I can't tell if that's just something weird about my font. Yeah, okay. It looked like there were two eyes in it or something. So I have to decide then how I want to notate it. Um, since I want it to look like a snare, I think I want it to be on the same space as the snare. So I'm going to increase the staff line until it's down there. So that's staff line three. They're numbered from top to bottom, zero, one, two, three, all the lines and spaces. Um, and I want it to be in voice one because I want it stems up, stems up, everything's fine there. Um, do I want to give it a shortcut? Yeah, probably I don't really need that shortcut for the hi-hat and all. So I'm going to steal the shortcut for hi-hat, give it the F shortcut. Um, but now i got to think about a note head, because this is the note head that I was using for snare, for the regular snare with the snares on. If I want the open tom to be, uh, I mean the open snare, to use a different note head, um, the X was already being used to indicate the side stick. So maybe that was the, the cross here, yeah. Um, I've got other options here. I've got triangles. I've got slashes. I've got diamonds, uh, X's in a circle. You know, I, I might consult other percussion literature to find out what they use for that sound. Maybe that sound just isn't used a whole lot in orchestral literature. Um, I don't like the way that that plus looks. It's just that circle with the slash thing seems pretty good. The triangle's fine. Triangles. I don't know the slash I use for other things. Um, the diamond's kind of nice. Yeah. Maybe I'll use the diamond. Um, so that is now going to be added to my drum set. And so now we should be able to see that that is available right here, the F. And now I can type F. Wow, that's a high tom, huh? Did I really get the right pitch in there? I said 50, right? And that said high tom. Let me edit this drum set again. Um, I can just right-click the staff, by the way, to get to uh, edit drum set. And I th said 50, but, you know, 48 was high mid tom. Maybe that was bad. There's also a thing that happens in MIDI where the numbers can be off by one because some people start their numbering at zero. Other people starting them at, start them at one. Um, uh, so anyhow, I might try pitch 40... Uh, let me just go ahead and add something for 48 and 48. So that was that. If I add something at 48 um, and just call it open snare, question mark, because I still don't know if that's right. And then I'll go to another one at 49, open snare, and just for grins, do another one at 51 in case I'm off by one in that direction. I want to hear what all these things sound like.
Okay, so I've got all these notes. I didn't do anything fancy about entry them because I just want to hear them to see uh, which one is which. If I had a MIDI keyboard or something, I'd be able to fiddle with that. So already I'm seeing that, you know, boy, that drum set uh, uh, dialogue could probably use some better um, facilities for that sort of thing. So those notes I just added. Um, mm. Oh, maybe I didn't finish adding them because I didn't define something for them. Do I have to? I didn't give them note heads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, normal note head. They 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 should show up. So I'm. Am I seeing them in here? Oh, because they're on the top line. Where are they? Where are my open snare? There it is. So if I um. Boy, that's even worse, right? So um. I would say that I got the right sound. Yeah. Um, that's just the way it is. Okay, so that's uh, what that thing is. Um, uh, it's obviously, it wasn't designed to be an open snare, so their idea of what an open high tom is is different than what maybe mine is. Um, anyhow, so now I've got the ability to enter that sound into my score. And I could do the same thing even if I wanted, like, there to be a triangle, say, combined with this. Um, I'm like, let me go into this this guy here and right click him and uh, hello, edit drum set. I want to remind myself what the triangle is. The open triangle is pitch 81. So now I can come to my concert snare staff and make the same change here. Go to pitch 81, call it open triangle and again give it a head I'll give it a across and move it above the staff so now I can come into my concert snare uh, part here and uh, let's just go ahead and put a triangle right here and now you can see I've got my triangle so I can have the snare and the triangle on the same staff there you go. Um, was that really all that playable? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if you're really good. Um, ding, mm, mm, yeah, that's you know that's probably asking a bit much, and that's that's maybe not something I would have combined. Um, that's something if you're writing for percussion, you have to think about what's physically possible for an orchestral player to pull off. Um, given that he's not like sitting in a drum set that's designed for optimal thing, he's actually you know sitting standing at a snare with two sticks in his hand and maybe the triangles off to the side maybe you don't make him do things really fast like that and even just going back and forth between the drum head and the side stick like that um, requires you know a little a little manipulation um, so yeah, you have to think about things like that when you're writing for percussion so um, anyhow those are some of the things that go on in writing for percussion uh, I talked about the voice aspect here uh, a little bit about customization. One thing I didn't talk about is overriding voices, um, and that's something that comes up. So let me just do a, a quick little demo of that. If I, for some reason, want to enter a snare drum into voice two, I could change the definition of my drum set. And right when I go to edit drum set, I find my snare drum. Uh, acoustic snare right here and then I could just change it to say default voice 2. But what if I want it to default to voice um, 2, but every once in a while I want it, I mean d default to voice 1, but every once in a while I want it in voice 2 maybe to be able to combine it with the bass drum or something a little more effectively. So when if I just type A, it enters into voice 1 because that's what that default is. Also if I double click the icon, it goes there. Or if I click the icon and then click in the score. All of those are ways of entering it. But let me just go on and enter a couple more to get to the next line. OK. If I want to enter a snare into voice two, I can do that. Let me delete this guy. What I will do is I'll click the icon, but then switch to voice two. And now when I click in the score, it entered that, vo that same note into voice two. Now it's still forcing the drum the uh, uh, stem up because that's how it's set in the drum in the um, drum set definition but I can press X to force that that down so this uh, you can override the voice uh, definitions when you do that now if I type an a now 
it goes back to voice one. A, when you type the keyboard, it always uses the default. Um, when I double click, I think if I double click, it's going to go back to the default, but to be honest, I don't remember, so let's find out. I've got voice two selected. Let's see what happens when I double click. It went back to voice one, which is kind of what I thought. So the, really the only way to override is you click this, change voice, and then click in the score. And now I've got it entered in voice two. So you do that if you have some special need to have the same drum usually be in one voice, but occasionally in another. It doesn't necessarily come up that often. So this idea of the click in the score uh, to enter things, it, it's, it's good. Um, the double click can be good. And I think if uh, um, accessibility-wise, I believe the drum palette is accessible, but I'm not actually sure. I'm not sure how you get there, if tabbing gets me there. I'm not totally positive about that, but the shortcuts are probably a good way, you know, if you've got the shortcuts defined well. But I'm not sure that the drum palette is accessible. Um, anyhow, that's been big on my mind lately is the accessibility of things, and the drum palette probably isn't. But as long as the shortcuts are defined, I can just type A and get my snare drum and so forth. Um, so uh, that's a bit about percussion and um, yeah I think uh, what I'd like to do uh, at this point um, I'm not seeing anything in the way of questions or anything but I'm always uh, open for that but just because again Tom's been on my mind I'm just gonna put on a little bit of music um, so like I've got all my music all my CDs but I don't have a CD player at least not here on my computer um, and uh, I mean, I've got one at home but you know I, I rarely listen to CDs I, um, I stream now and and I pay for my streaming but I do the I do pay my 10 bucks a month or whatever it is on Spotify because um, it's really useful for me teaching to get the extra features of the uh, um, whatever pro or whatever the um, the paid subscription is. But I'm just going to put on a uh, one of my compositions. So one of the nice things with Tom is, um, and with jazz drumming in particular, is yeah, I'm showing you how to notate stuff for for drums. But the reality is, we don't notate completely for jazz and drums. We expect that the drummers know more than we do, if unless you're a drummer. And even then, you expect that other drummers aren't going to want to play things exactly like you are. So you might enter. If you're creating an arrangement, you might enter a sample drum part, but you still expect the drummer to uh, um, to know how to uh, you know sort of create his own part that's you know along the same lines as the original, but maybe you know speak it works for him a little better. And so when I would write a piece, I would rarely write drum parts, especially if I'm just writing a lead sheet. Certainly, I'm not writing a drum part, but I would describe to Tom how I wanted it to go, and. Um, uh, Tom had this really unique ability to just read my mind and read what I was saying um, about uh, or understand what I was saying about how I wanted the drums to go so that when I would write a piece with a particular idea of what I wanted for drums I could just describe it to him and he would really get the idea of it and then anytime I worked with other drummers I would play them recordings <laughs> of Tom playing the piece so anyhow this is one of my pieces called um, Ferengi um, which uh, the name comes from what does the name come from uh, well, it's Ferengi is a Star Trek uh, character, but not a one character, a race of characters. Oh yeah, because they were. Oh yeah, <laughs> because um, this they were a race typified by um, kind of being like kind of greedy um, and uh, or being capitalists. But the worst aspect of capitalists of just really being very um, very money focused. And um, uh, the melody to this piece piece is. Uh, reminiscent of the Price is Right theme. So it, that's what made me think of uh, Ferengi. So anyhow, this is Ferengi with uh, Tom Van Skoik on drums.
Um, there's like a number of different things that happened, different fields that happened in there that had a change at particular places, and I was able to describe them to Tom in words, and he was able to put it to music. So yeah, Colleen, thanks for um, checking on that. Uh, yeah, the open snare, I mean, it is a thing, but it's not something that typically gets notated. It's something you choose to do in, on, in jazz anyhow, but I would have to imagine that somewhere in the orchestral world there must be a notation. Probably you just write a text notation that says snares off and then you just keep writing the same note um, is probably the way it would be done. Um, but yeah, I've never really um, thought about notating that. There's some drummers that just really like playing with open snare um, sound. Um, so uh, those are some of the things about drum notation. Um, there was like one thing I also wanted to show, since I did, I showed you that R command for repeating a measure. Um, I should mention that there's two other notations that get used, um, and one of them uh, is the repeat measure symbol. Like if I want to repeat that same measure over and over again, I can bring my palettes back with F9, and then come here to the uh, repeats and jumps, and the measure repeat symbol here. This symbol here, um, should that be displaying under the staff there? Probably not. Um, eh, whatever. Um, so if I delete these measures here, I can add that repeat measure symbol, or I could select several measures and double click that repeat, repeat measure to add it to all. So this is a repeat measure, and it means repeat the previous measure. Right? It didn't repeat on this staff because I didn't put the repeat measure symbol in it in this staff. So um, the repeat measure symbol is really useful for drum patterns. Now in drum patterns, often the pattern isn't two isn't one measure long; it's two measures long. So you really need a two measure repeat for that. And MuseScore doesn't have one built in. So there is the workaround of adding a symbol to your score by um, typing Z to display the symbols palette, and then I can type in here to re I'll type. Uh, repeat and here's a two measure repeat and a four measure repeat. So what I can do is drag or double click or whatever to add this symbol to my score. So if I want to add it, say I'll add it to this staff here. I'll add it here, but it doesn't go here. It goes directly over the bar line. So I would have to, oh, and I think I might have to like disable, well I might, I guess I don't have to disable automatic placement, but I might get, um, Notice it was like expanding the measure there. So if I press equals to disable automatic placement, I can move it a little more freely. There we go. Um, now, notice it's really attached to that rest, and I had to manually position it over this bar line. For MuseScore 3.3, I've added the ability to be able to add a uh, um, symbol directly to a bar line, so there won't be as much manual adjustment. Because this manual adjustment makes me nervous, because it's really dependent on the width of that measure, how far I'm having to adjust it. So as soon as I make a change to this, say, get rid of that line break, and now my measure's narrower, suddenly <laughs> this thing is no longer on the bar line, because I dragged it too far. So really, I didn't want to have to attach it to a rest and drag it. I really want to attach it to the bar line directly, and in MuseScore 3.3 that'll be possible. So that'll be one of the things that I'll hopefully get to show you next week, assuming everything is uh, is together. So yeah, Jeff Hamilton is definitely someone, Ed, Ed, Ed Blackwell was one of the other sort of pioneers in, in really using that sound in a jazz setting of open, open snare. So um, uh, that was some stuff about percussion, and uh, hopefully um, people, there's, you know, Hopefully some people found something of what I just did uh, a little bit useful. Just tried to capture a lot of the different things that go on in, in uh, percussion notation. There's a whole whole art to it, a whole whatever of writing to writing for and writing for percussion, just what it means musically to write for percussion effectively, but also how to notate it effectively. Oh, there's I guess the one other thing I should show you is the other thing that happens in a jazz setting. Oh wait a minute, Tom Solo is coming up now. by the rest of the band.
accompanied drum solo there. Um, yeah, that was a great drummer. Um, miss him. Uh, so I was going to talk about something else. Oh, I was going to talk about the fact that when writing for drum set, another common thing to do is to use slash notation. So I just want to show this really uh, quickly, this technique for writing uh, um, jazz drum set stuff. So often what we do is we want to write accents in, um, like to say, oh, there's like a hit on one and four or something. Let's make one be on one and the and of two. So I'm going to use the snare drum. I'm going to enter a hit on uh, one. And then uh, eighth rest, because there's no point using a dotted quarter note. The dot doesn't lengthen the quarter note for a drum. So I'm going to write a quarter note, quarter rest, and then there. So there's my bump. Oh, that's the accent that I want. So the way we write this for a drum set, if we want to tell them where the accents are, but say, you know, just play, just play time here, but there's accents on the one and the end of two, is we write these notes above the staff, small. So we have a special notation for that called rhythmic slash notation. So what I'm going to do is I wrote that here in voice one, but now I'm going to move it to voice three um, for reasons that will become obvious in a second. So I'm going to use tools, voices, exchange one and three. So now it's in voice one and three. Now I'm going to go to, uh, am I doing this in the right order? Yeah, I think I am. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, I'm going to undo that for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have to think about the right order for this because I haven't done this in a little bit. So now you get to watch me flounder for a minute. I'm going to try the toggle rhythmic slash notation first, then the exchange and see if that does the right thing. Now the voice exchange one and three. No, that didn't do the right thing. So I had it right the first time. I select the measure. Let me undo that. Select the measure. I'm going to move the notes to voice three. Then I'm going to toggle rhythmic slash notation. Now you see they're moved to the top of the staff. And now what I want to do is I want to just fill the rest of the measure with slashes. So I can go to tools, fill with slashes and it filled voice one with slashes. This is how drum set music is typically written. We don't try to write out everything. Maybe we write out the beginning of the piece, like a sample drum part, but then after that we just write slashes and say, now just play. But we'll write in accents above the staff like that to say, oh, you know, the, the, maybe the, the trombone section is playing a thing there and you should maybe play that along with them. It doesn't mean they should play these notes necessarily. It means they should know that those notes exist. So that's another technique of writing for percussion to be aware of. All right, um, so as per usual, kind of rambled for a little bit, covered a bunch of different things in no particular order other than when I happen to think of them in, but that's the nature of these cafes. Hope, uh, hope it ends up being useful. Um, with any luck, maybe next week I get to talk about MuseCore 3.3 in more detail. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, uh, leave it at that here and sign off for now, and uh, we'll... See you next week and hope you all have a, a great week. Bye.